Hello, thank you. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Perimeter Institute and welcome to the Mike Lazaridis Theatre of Ideas. The in-house audience has just watched the first a screening of a very special documentary, The Truth is in the Stars. And as we welcome the online audience, we're going to start a panel discussion to talk about the big themes and ideas that the, mov the movie brought to light. So, for the online audience, if you would like to engage in questions and ask questions, please use Twitter and at Perimeter and use the, the hashtag PI Live. The in-house audience, of course, the microphone is, is there and you'll be ready to, to get started. So, let me introduce our wonderful panelists and get right down to questions. So, on this side, this is Craig Thompson. He is the executive producer and president of Ballinran Entertainment and the producer of The Truth is in the Stars. Welcome. Thank you. Beside Craig is Neil Turok, director and co a cosmologist and director of Perimeter Institute. <laughs> Welcome, Neil. <laughs> and this is Natalie Panic. She is a rocket scientist and a science communicator from MDA. Welcome. And on the far side is Avery Broderick. Avery is an astrophysicist and a faculty member here at Perimeter. Welcome, Avery. So I will take the first question. Craig, let's, let's start with you. It was a, a wonderful film. What? If you could give us a little bit of the backstory between how, how you came to be involved in this and how you engaged uh, with, with Bill, with William Shatner. Well, um, having worked with Bill on a number of projects over the last number of years, I've witnessed firsthand the scores of people who've come up to him at fan conventions and private events and uh, various functions where they have said how much Star Trek and uh, Captain Kirk in particular have influenced them to make decisions in their lives to become physicists, scientists, pilots, and astronauts. So always in the back of my mind, I wanted to drill down more deeply into that topic and ask what role does science fiction and Star Trek in particular play in inspiring us to reach for the stars and solve some of the mysteries, greatest, universe, greatest mysteries of the universe. And the theory that we approached the film with was that unlike other types of science fiction, Star Trek will stand the test of time because in 250 years from now, people will look back and say, it's a time capsule for where we are right now, but it has credibility because it's rooted in real science. Mm -hmm. And Bill himself has an insatiable appetite, insatiable curiosity to, answer, to ask the deep questions. So he was a natural every man to ask the kind of questions that we all are baffled by in the, in the world of astrophysics and cosmology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, let's have a question in-house. You're up. Just to follow up on our friend's observation, that as we look at the bigger picture, it does seem simpler. Mm -hmm. You interviewed a lot of very iconic Canadian personalities, um, and we saw a range of what's happening here on the planet. And I think that's where the complexity is. How do we pass the way for this future research? How do we finance it? How do we uh, stop um, the environmental issues, the economical issues, the political issues? Our simple problems seem to get in the way of us achieving our big goals. Right. <laughs> Who would like um, to take so that? So the values was a thing that was, came out again on your slides mm -hmm. about Star Trek. There was an innate value system built in that show that was obviously written in there by the writer. Exactly. How do we write that in our lives? Right. Beautiful, beautiful question. I think, uh, I, go sorry. ahead. I was just going to say, your question reminded me about what Emily Lakdawalla was talking about and how we need to foster the international relationships necessary for exploration. And I think mm. so often we're caught up in these national goals and these national boundaries that really prevent us from learning fast and efficiently. And I did an internship at NASA Ames with an international group of students and it was such an instant reminder that we need to be fostering those in international relationships that will make the future of exploration possible. And that's kind of just a broad picture of where we need to do. I don't know if I have the answers to say how do we 
overcome those simple things like politics and money to get there, but we need to have that bigger picture mm -hmm. in mind. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. I'm gonna take the next question and, and follow that thread and maybe even stick with you, Natalie. The, to create that environment, science communication, it's, it's part of that equation. Can you go into a little bit more about your role in, in, in science communication, why you're passionate about it, and, and what you hope to achieve? Sure, for me, it's a reminder on a daily basis just to really embrace curiosity, which Craig was talking about. I think so often it's easy to get, easy to get distracted or to get caught up in different priorities that take away from that childlike awe and wonder for the world. And I grew up thinking that an explorer had to be someone like an astronaut or a guy covered head to toe in mud with a gnarly beard and that you had to have money and expensive gear to explore. But I realized over time that everyone in this room, everyone watching is an explorer. We are all everyday explorers because all you need is curiosity and that learning knows no boundaries. So I would encourage everyone in here today to remind yourself how much fun it is to be curious. Mm -hmm. I saw some clapping and I agree. <laughs> Let's go uh, in studio for another question. Mike's a little low. <laughs> so at the beginning of this, you talked about bringing art and science together, in particular in trying to bring science to everyone through art. and. It was talked about a bit at the beginning, and I didn't. I saw some of it in the film, but I wanted to understand sort of where you can see us taking that driver of really exposing science to people who don't necessarily look for it, mm -hmm. but bringing it to them in a way that they can digest and then go, oh, wow, I really want to learn more about that because mm -hmm. I'm an engineer by training. So for me, that curiosity is already there. So I love those shows where there is science. But how do we get somebody to see that show and then go, I really want to know more? I think our intent was to show people that science really is accessible, that everyone has the same curiosity that scientists do, and that we're all dreamers at heart. And if you can look at the mysteries that you're trying to solve, whether you're a scientist or a layperson, if you follow your dreams, that's where art leads you in, into science. So that's all we're trying to do is sort of set the tone for where I think and where, where Bill thinks scientific, sharing scientific knowledge with everyone should come in if we make it accessible. As Neil deGrasse uh, Tyson said, make it sweet and be able to uh, present it to people that would be a greater, um, I think people would embrace science more, more quickly and more readily. Does anyone else want to chime in? Well, yeah, so, so um, uh, I have four kids, and, and one of the wonderful things about having children is that they remind you how incredible everything is. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we all, I think, began life asking questions. I mean, uh, we all have the stories of asking parents why too many times, either from the perspective of the child or more frequently from the, uh, the side of the parent. Um, hey, and at some point, we're told that our questions don't matter. And, and maybe we move on to more practical concerns, like finding a job and making our way in life, which is uh, you know, frequently a difficult and complicated process. And, and for many of us who are fortunate enough to be professional scientists, uh, we just lucked out and didn't have to grow up, right? So um, you know, nurturing that inner child in all of us, I think, is a a critical element towards uh, uh, you know, building communication with, with people at large, and it's also part of the duty of being a scientist. You know, I can, I can go off and discover something in my office, but it's not science until I tell people about it. And, and uh, you know, the most important people to tell aren't necessarily the people who toil away with me, but, but the world who supports this and uh, who benefits the most. And so, you know, maybe another part of your, the answer to your question is we, we do have these amazing science communicators like Neil deGrasse Tyson um, and, and others like him. And, and uh, you know, th they are a critical element, not just to, uh, you know, doing some sort of public relations or, or entertainment, but making the scientific process happen by communicating it back to the public. And maybe we should all do more of that. I think I'd give, like to give a slightly different answer to the same question, which is 
something that always intrigued me about Star Trek is it represented the two sides of human beings. One is the logical, rational uh, uh, you know, side which um, Spock represented. And then the other one is the much more human and fallible, but also in a way wiser side that Kirk represented. And this, the combination of these two human qualities, you know, in, in tandem, which were obviously much stronger together right, than they are separately, um, uh, were, was very powerful in the movie. So I think one way of drawing people into science is to realize that actually science is not everything. Um, uh, you know, humanity, feeling for others, support for others, emotions are, are uh, the other side of the coin. And I think it's very unfortunate that science is often separated from those things. So scientists are just seen as technicians and, um, you know, people more or less who work at the service of other bigger forces. Um, and that's too bad because uh, I think these, the two sides of the coin really have to come together. Uh, and that, that's a way of bringing everybody in, in, into science much more, just to express that science is not the whole story. That was eloquent, but I have to do this camera. Zoom in to what he's wearing. <laughs> okay. Now, this Sh is... Show the other th side. Choose love. Choose love. <laughs> yeah. This is not a hippie T-shirt, right? This is, a, this is a refugee... Uh, uh, this is in support of refugees. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Let's take another question. Um, <clears throat> Star Trek presents us with a world of a technological science utopia. And it's, it seems to me that while the, the greatest threat to capitalism is capitalists, the greatest threat to communism is communists, and I dare say the greatest threat to Christianity is probably Christians. <laughs> What is it that you believe may be inherent about technology that's, that's capable of inspiring us beyond the human factors that bring every other beautiful dream to rack and ruin? Mm. Who would you like to start? Wow. <laughs> it's I don't know. Question. Whoever wants to tackle that one. Because I think, I think that was Gene Roddenberry's essential vision, uh -huh. was that science and technology are capable of taking us beyond the human factors that make a mess of everything else. There is a backdrop, a social backdrop to the Star Trek world, which I would describe as a communal meritocracy. Some people, because there's no money, you know, there's no finance. Some people might call it communism, but communism has been tainted by everything that's happened in the last century. It's, you can't really use that word anymore. Mm -hmm. Communal meritocracy, yes, but how do we get there? It, can it be from technology alone, or does it, is it going to take more than that from some other direction, mm -hmm. other than technology and science itself? Mm -hmm. There. Panelists? Yeah, I, I'll take that on. Oh, you go. You go first. <laughs> I was. I feel like almost in a way the the theme of this panel, science and art, answers your question. You need that art to go along with the science in order to get to that next step, to get to that future that we envision. As I was watching the movie, I was reminded of a quote that I learned in a high school class that said, "Art upsets and science reassures." And when we were given the quote, we had to argue one extreme or the other, and I don't think it is as polarizing as that. I think it's this happy medium where science and the arts have an ability to induce a reaction out of us and to inspire us and to engage our imaginations to dream of those positive possibilities, and that allows us to dream up innovations that can help build resilient and sustainable communities. Thank you. Add to it? Yeah, no, it's a huge question. Um, <laughs> I, but, but I think I wouldn't agree that, I mean, I don't know what Gene Rodden, Roddenberry thought, but to think that technology is going to solve problems of society, I think is very misleading. And uh, particularly, we see many examples of that today where, uh, you know, the slogan innovation is, is the one which politicians refer to as the cure-all. Uh, yet the reality is that a lot of innovation is actually destroying jobs and uh, allowing, I mean, we just had all the fuss about Uber today, 
you know, it's the, the, the pursuit of technolo technological answers uh, often causes, you know, the blind pursuit of that while neglecting human factors uh, can be ext extremely dangerous. And so I can't, I can't really see how anyone could see technology alone as, you know, the future for hu humankind. Technology is very dangerous, uh, very often has many dangerous sides, as we know. Uh, so um, I would much rather see it as that, um, and I think this is what Star Trek was reaching for, was um, uh, an understanding of us and our place in the universe. We have this huge playground, I mean this almost infinite playground to explore, to understand, to make use of. Uh, it comes along with a tremendous responsibility. You know, when you think of this massive opportunity lying ahead of humankind, I think that should be galvanizing all of us to behave responsibly with what we have now, because we are responsible for all future generations. I mean, if, if, we, if we're irresponsible, they, they won't be a future. Um, and I, I would hope that vision, that sort of inspiring vision of what might be possible for our successes uh, would inspire all of us to behave much more wisely and responsibly and respectfully of each other and, and you know, combine forces to do amazing things. Um, and I think to a large extent these old political philosophies which tend to pit one class against another or one interest group against another have to be superseded. Uh, it's not that technology is the answer, it's because the, the future ahead of us is so, uh, you know, uh, so enormous um, uh, and offers so much potentially, it requires us to become better than we have been before. Uh, and we've got to just lose these, you know, old habits. And I think in a way Star Trek was reaching for this, right? The, the, the vision of a unified world and that everybody, the diversity, this, is, this had a huge impact on me. Seeing a Russian on the, uh, you know, on the, as one of the, uh, the commanders on a, with a U.S. captain, that yeah, was really revolutionary in the 60s, right? Because there was the Cold War and all that. And uh, so... so um, Star Trek was definitely promoting diversity as a great uh, source of strength. And I think it was well ahead of its time in doing that. And we, we should be learning that lesson today much more and more deeply, that diversity uh, and, and unifying different peoples is a very, very powerful force for progress and rationality. In the green room, as we were preparing, we were talking about optimism and the power of optimism and how Star Trek has been optimistic and I feel like this is along the same lines. And Craig, you captured that in, in, in the film. Can you tell us how you captured it? Well, there's so much negativity in the media today and we really wanted to set a, a tone that people should be excited about the potential for human progress and not discouraged by it even though they might not understand it. How important is optimism in <laughs> science? And I'm going to go all the way to Avery. Um, if you are not a diehard optimist, you'll simply curl up and cry yourself to sleep every day. <laughs> um, science is a bastion of incredible creativity because nature is so cruel. Uh, Currently, frequently completely uh, dispenses with your latest, greatest idea, no matter how wonderful you thought it was when you thought it up in the shower. Um, <laughs> happens almost uh, hourly. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I sometimes describe science uh, as having a single article of faith, which is the world uh, and the universe can be understood. Um, there's nothing, nothing uh, guaranteed in the, in, in the general uh, process of science after you've accepted or, or, or chosen to believe that. So optimism is, uh, without that, we are lost. Yeah. Thank you. And Natalie, how did optimism, or did it, help you get to where you are today? I think on a more literal approach, I come from a background working on space robotics. So right now, helping build a Mars rover or building space robotics to repair pair satellites and these are difficult projects that are world first and every day you overcome 
have to overcome challenges and obstacles. And if you don't have that optimism and belief and excitement for what comes next, then you're really going to struggle when it, you hit those barriers. But when you do have that little small moment of success and you can feed off that optimism, you build momentum to keep going and solve really difficult problems. And Neil, you uh, certainly embody optimism. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, without optimism, there, there's no chance that I would have uh, continued as a, as a theoretical physicist. I mean, trying to understand the beginning of everything and the beginning of the universe, you have to be an optimist to believe that it's possible. Uh, we, but, but many things reinforce your optimism. Uh, one of them is the incredible power of experimenters to do much more than even they appreciate. So very often in my career, I've, I've talked to experimenters and said, if only you could measure this, you know, we would learn so much. And they invariably say, it's hopeless. It's impossible. We can't be done. And then uh, five years later, they will figure out some really clever way to do it. And five years after that, it's become routine. So um, science is, I mean, as Avery said, it's an incredible reinforcer of unjustified optimism, <laughs> okay? And so I and my colleagues at Perimeter are full of unjustified optimism. Um, but what's given us the confidence to have this optimism is the repeated ability of experimenters and observers to, to do the impossible. So, I mean, it's part of being human that we don't know what brought us here. We have these qualities as human beings if somebody told you a priori can this, you know, um, uh, you know, essentially advanced ape, you know, may be able to throw a, a stone around like in two thousand, uh, a bone around like in two thousand one, you know, are they going to be flying spaceships? Or you would say that's just totally ridiculous. But we have come so far, so quickly, and it's only getting faster. Uh, I think just the pace of our advance. Uh, has to give us all unbelievable optimism. So the more deeply you think about the history of physics and science and, and, um, and uh, you know, the rate of change, I, it's very hard to under, for any of us who work in physics to understand why everyone else is pessimistic. I mean, with us, it's just blindingly obvious that this unbridled uh, confidence is, pays off. And it, it keeps doing it more and more. That brings us in the door every morning. <laughs> That's fantastic. Right. Let's shift gears to science and creativity. What you were able to do, Craig, obviously a very creative endeavor to create a film. Science, on the other hand, is often perceived to be rigid, rule-based, pretty structured. How is it, or what is the role of creativity in science? And we'll start with the rocket scientist. <laughs> I guess if you think in terms of engineering, I like to think of engineering as inventing and to invent something, to come up with new designs, to dream up the way that planetary rovers are gonna look like, that takes an element of creativity, to dream up something that has never existed before and to get that literally pencil on paper, sketching out ideas, absolutely. Love it. Avery? So, so I sometimes think of, um of science as being akin to classical poetry. You know, there's great creativity involved, but there's also rules, rhyme and meter. And, and in science, uh, come up with uh, all these fantastic ideas, but then you have to be able to make predictions and you have to go test these predictions. Um, and, and so there's, there's you know, any source of, of uh, creative, uh, creativity, any source of new ideas is absolutely welcome, but then imposed upon this is this method for weeding out those handful that happen to describe the way the universe works. Right. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's that process of weeding them out that, uh, you know, I think scientists are sometimes described, dare I say it, as arrogant, but that's because once you find one, one of those diamonds in the rough that actually explains something, um, by God, you hold on to that with, <laughs> with uh, everything you have. Um, but you didn't find it without looking uh, at, at a thousand other ideas that failed first. Right. All right. And now, just before we flip that question back on its head to you, Craig, if there are questions, please make your way to the mic. We'll, uh, we'll work you in. So here's the, the flip side of that. It is so creative. What you created was so creative. And yet, you were telling me what it took to create the film. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, 
the rigor, the speed, the, the ferocity of making the film, and how do you stay creative within that framework? Well, I want to start off by putting some context into it. I, did, I scraped by in high school math and science, even though I desperately wanted to understand it. So I've always wanted to answer the questions in my own creative way. So that is sort of where I approached the, the story. But the problem we had with the film, not the problem, the challenge was, we had 15 interviews, or we had more interviews, but we narrowed it down to 15. We had 15 days, we had three countries and three time zones. So we had to literally race around the world between the beginning of July of last year until the end of August uh, and do what you saw on, on, on screen. So it was incredibly challenging. The other challenge that we had was how do you pick the people who will give you a broad enough perspective to represent the creativity and the science without getting it too esoteric or too deep for people to understand. We were very fortunate um, in, in the final tally of the people who agreed to uh, take part, but our ultimate uh, journey, our destination, and it's thanks to Neil that we're able to get uh, Stephen Hawking, because that was like the holy grail interview for all of us, and for me, it was like meeting Gandhi or Nelson Mandela, so. Yes. yes. Thank you. Question at the microphone. Um, hi. I'm one of a number of students who are here uh, tonight from the University of Waterloo. And uh, we are all taking a class that is called Rhetoric of Science. Mm. And part of this conversation and part of the things that came up in the movie sort of touch upon things that we've been discussing. So I would like to sort of pose this question to you as well to see what your answer will be. And throughout the movie, we saw this idea of sort of like unifying knowledge. And one of the first things Avery uh, said was, you know, you're working in your office and you're doing science, but it isn't really science until you're able to communicate those facts, right, to other people. And I was wondering also because of the questions related to technology, when you have, um, I don't know, 60,000, 70,000 papers published in one particular discipline every year. How did you help people from the general public that have a very big um, or a very good handle of, on science mm -hmm. or let's say not a very deep knowledge of how things work in the details mm -hmm. to understand what is going on and to sort of what to do with that knowledge or where that knowledge is going. Mm -hmm. And I'm also asking this question because very often we see that um, sometimes when scientists get tangled up in the science of things, when they are trying to sort of express their ideas, they get caught up in not being able to be understood as well as they should. And this often sort of opens the spaces for people like Trump to come and say, you know, environmental change is fiction. Um, so it's interesting because there is an interesting continuum between like fiction and fact. And you sort of start with this notion of, I think it was Natalie who's saying something like, you start with sort of thinking of the improbable. You start thinking of things that maybe are not necessarily possible right now because you need to, to come to a solution for something that you don't, like a solution you don't have right at this moment. But it doesn't mean that, um, that fiction, so that doesn't mean that fiction is necessarily a bad thing, but often I feel that science becomes these things that is sort of so abstract that it's very easy for someone, again, like Trump, to come and say, well, that is kind of like fiction, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what are your thoughts on that. Mm. Okay, who's well, willing to jump in? Well, so, so the, the, the first thing I, I would say, and I'm, I'm not sure how popular this, this will be with all of my colleagues, is, um, if you can't explain it to a uh, freshman uh, a college physics student, you don't really understand it. Um, and so the people who, you know, when I, let, let's personalize it, when I have great diff difficulty explaining something without filling it with a lot of jargon and, and a lot of mathematical technology, I find that I don't really understand it. And so one of the most useful things I do is I go talk to people. And I try to explain something, especially to somebody who's a bit removed from what I'm doing from day to day, because it clarifies my thinking um, of, of what it is that I'm trying to, to study or explain. Right. Um, the second thing is a lot of, a lot of the uh, discussion in journals is really 
a, a scientific discussion amongst the practitioners where we're trying to sort out exactly this explanation process. And you can, you can follow this along and, and look at what's happened uh, 50 years ago or even 100 years ago. Now these things are part of uh, popular culture. And so I spend a lot of my time thinking about black holes. And black holes are not, not perfectly uh, presented in movies. Uh, every now and then there's a movie that claims to, to be scientifically accurate as a tagline, right? So uh, for me, Interstellar was a watershed event. The first time a movie was actually sold as being scientifically accurate. But, um, but, you know, black holes have entered, I think, the public consciousness. And so that conversation really takes off uh, once scientists have understood the ideas uh, uh, themselves, I think, more fully. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take two seconds to agree with you from my <laughs> former life as a physics teacher. The, a young physics teacher, it's really easy to give kids problems that come out with numerical answers and units and you can check them right and you feel like you've taught them something and they've learned something and you're really quite proud. It takes time and, and knowledge to seep in as a teacher and then the courage to be able to actually dig deeper and uncover the, the conversations that really talk about the understanding of whatever physical phenomena you're talking about. And uh, that, that is a challenging thing to do, I think from college freshmen down to much, much, much younger. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Natalie. I think there's also an element of collaboration to the idea of science communication. There's that level of understanding and be, being able to explain it, but there's also sometimes a need to visualize something. And that's where there's a beautiful collaboration between the arts and the sciences and engineering, where you can have artists come in and help sketch out or make paintings or pictures to put out into the public and get the public excited about things that you're working on. And that's not a new idea. Back in the 1960s, James Webb at NASA started what was known as the NASA Art Program. And he literally brought in artists to start help conveying the missions that the scientists and engineers were working on to again, get the public excited and to help them imagine what was out there and what was possible. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Yeah, so you, you, one of the many interesting points you raised is the, just the sheer volume of science today and the number of papers and, you know, conferences and concepts. It looks completely unmanageable for anybody to, to really appreciate what's going on. There's just so much of it. So from this point of view, theoretical physics is a very special subject because what the whole goal of it is to crystallize what we know about the universe into a few very simple and powerful principles. So by and large, the whole field is about filtering out all this stuff, <laughs> which may be very complicated, involved, uh, confused, and, uh, and understanding what are the simple truths about the world. And the amazing thing is this is possible, that uh, you know, over millennia, uh, theories of physics have been developed, which have turned out to be spectacularly powerful based on a few really, uh, you know, at heart, extremely simple principles. For example, that space and time can bend like an elastic substance. You know, th this turned out to be a really, really powerful idea. And, and recently we've seen all kinds of verification with gravitational waves and black holes. Um, and so I would say uh, if you look at science and you just see how big the whole enterprise is, uh, that's totally misleading. I mean, the size has nothing to do with the value. The value is in, in what's essential and simple and somehow deep truths about uh, reality. Um, and those take a long time um, and only occur very, very rarely. But that's the goal of the whole enterprise. And when they, those principles are discovered, all the massive volume can simply be thrown away. And it said that's just a consequence of the other thing, these basic principles and ideas which we've understood. So the, in, a, in, in many ways, I think all of us practitioners in science would say there's such a large volume out there, we simply cannot read it, nor would we want to. You know, there will be a natural debate and uh, to and fro of ideas and the good ones will survive. And the, the, most of it will just be dross, which will, uh, you know, ultimately not, uh, not lead anywhere. <laughs> and Craig, thinking to your youthful self grappling with math and science, what kept the passion alive for you not being a scientist? 
desperation, I suppose. <laughs> I, I just didn't, I actually wanted to be an airline pilot is really what I wanted to do, but I couldn't, pa I couldn't get through physics or math, and uh, I happened to be really good at telling stories. And uh, to Avery's point, I think what science needs is uh, storytellers to be able to boil down what uh, you folks are researching and talking about to make it accessible. Um, I'm teaching a, a course right now at the University of Waterloo where most of the students are either physics or computer science or engineering students, and it's about uh, boiling down their idea into a simple story that they can convey. And I think that's an important part of science education, is, which is lacking, I think, in, in making it accessible. Thank you. And we have another question at the microphone. Uh, Dr. Turek, um, you presented a, an interesting topic uh, around um, kind of us representing the consciousness of, of, uh, of the universe. Um, and consciousness is, is this really interesting kind of evolutionary trait that uh, we've developed almost for the purpose of self-preservation. And that works really well on kind of the time scale of a human. Um, but then when you kind of extend that time scale to a planetary time scale, it kind of breaks down and we're already seeing the ramifications of that. Could you guys comment on um, any of the, uh, the mechanisms that you see kind of humanity putting in place as we grow or science putting in place as we grow to start trying to develop more of a, a consciousness for humanity that's kind of concerned about that, that longer time scale as opposed to that self-optimization? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, one of the, one of the surprise, I agree with you, our consci consciousness undoubtedly arose as a useful tool for survival. But it turned out to be way more powerful than was needed. Uh, so it's allowed us to develop theories of the whole universe, um, which, you know, to some extent have been verified by experiment. And uh, so I, I would say it's almost as if, you know, reaching this level of development and, and acquiring a consciousness, suddenly the whole, the whole of the universe has become accessible to us. Why that is, it's a very deep mystery. Why it should be the universe can be understood, makes sense, can be utilized by human beings. I think it's one of the big miracles of our existence. And we're you know, nowhere near understanding why that should be. But, but so I would say we're, you know, we're more or less following, following our noses. We've discovered some magic about nature and there seems to be no limits to what it can do. Um, so, to answer your question, what can this do to build a consciousness around the earth? I think one, you know, one of the, greatest, the strongest ways of doing that is to communicate to people, especially kids, the magical opportunities that science and understanding the universe now offers. And how small and irrelevant and petty our disagreements are on the planet as compared to the big picture. So what I very much hope is when people appreciate the big picture, they'll say, you know what? These little arguments we're having are just besides the point. Let's get together and take advantage of this amazing opportunity we all have. Let's take one last question from the microphone. Hi. Um, so science fiction um, is very much a human art and so we embed humanness into it because we just don't understand what's out there. So aliens are very human in form or animal in form. Um, as we discover new, potentially new complex life forms that don't resemble humans, um, as scientists, is that going to change your feelings towards science fiction and your <laughs> excitement over it? Um, will it take the passion out of it, just because you're you're unraveling things that have driven science fiction for a very long time. Right. Um, Maybe let's start with you, and we'll go all the way across. <laughs> um, so, so you mean when we run across a horda, how are you going to feel about it? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I think that part of. Uh, you know, one of the miraculous things about humanity is that we can transcend uh, recognizing ourselves solely in, in the mirror or solely within our own families, but recognize ourselves as one with the entirety of humanity. Um, and, and now we begin the process of recognizing ourselves as one 
with the entirety of, of life. And it just seems like a natural evolution to me to begin to thinking of ourselves as, as uh, part of a whole of the universe, right? So, um, so, so in that, I, I, I think that this is a very natural evolution and one, in fact, that that's, I think Star Trek spoke to um, nearly uniquely. I mean, I, th there are plenty of science fiction stories with aliens, but, um, you know, within the confines of, of the, uh, you know, Adventure Week format, I think Star Trek did it better than most, if not all, the idea that there was humanity to be found in things that were distinctly not human, um, and that we could find a common ground or a common way to, to find ourselves at one with them. I think science fiction is always gonna be one step ahead of science. One of the recent films that I saw that I really enjoyed was Arrival. And they had linguists working on that film, imagining how we as humans deciphered languages from eons ago and then projecting that into uh, contact with intelligent life based on the premise that every intelligent being, whether it be an alien life form or not, has to communicate in some way, which is why when we send probes into deep space, we send music, we send artifacts from Earth, because we think there's something embedded in that. Music is mathematics, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something embedded to that that an intelligent life form will understand. Mm -hmm. So I think science fiction will always be pushing uh, the boundaries, and then science will try to solve some of those mysteries. So there is an online question, and I'd like to give everyone one chance for a, a last word as well. So I'll ask the question, which is spectacular, and then any last, uh, last thoughts. And why don't we, just, Neil, we'll start with you. The question, and this is for all of you, uh, which Star Trek character do you relate to most and why? Huh. <laughs> yeah, that's a very tough question. I, I don't think I related to one more than others. As I said before, I, I really enjoyed the duality between Spock and Kirk, uh, both flawed, but uh, when you combine them, uh, they had both the sort of incredible rationality and uh, uh, yeah, super, superhuman qualities of Spock, but also the very human qualities of Kirk, uh, which in some contexts were wiser. The willingness to, to, to trust gut instinct and to have a gut instinct. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to evade the question and have both of them. Your prerogative, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Craig? I'm not a huge Star Trek fan, but if I were to choose one character, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I, I, I enjoyed watching it, but I'm not a Trek. Uh, and I think the character that inspired me the most was actually Captain Picard, because he approached science as an art, as an artist, and, and a creative person. And I think for me, I think uh, he really rounded out the character of a, of a captain uh, the best for me. I do enjoy Star Trek, but I, I can't rhyme off the characters or the catchphrases of all the different shows. Very good. Let's boldly go to Avery. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, with absolutely no aspirations to be the director of Perimeter, but I, I would say I would say Kirk, and and I think I think because for, you know Star Trek speaks to us in many different ways. It speaks to us about uh, our humanity, and it speaks to us about um, you know a hopeful vision uh, of the future that happens. We listen to the best of what's inside of us instead of a cynical view that will inevitably happen when the worst of us conquers. Um, but it also it spoke to me personally with this sense of adventure that I think we've already talked about. And I think Kirk was a consummate explorer, you know, is, uh, went out uh, pushing back the boundary of the darkness, but, but did so with uh, a reverence for, for knowledge, um, you know, a, sort of eschewing all of the technological power that he had at his hands, but instead uh, seeking understanding. Um, and I think that's in many ways what I hope to be, so. <laughs> Thank you. And Natalie, your character and the last word. For me, it was Wesley Crusher because he was the closest in age and it was someone who I could see myself having the same next steps. If I wanted to captain the USS Enterprise, I would go to Starfleet Academy and take that similar path. And I think it was also interesting to have different generations on Star Trek and that theme of accountability and sustainability and making sure we're not 
burdening future generations with the decisions of the current generation. And that means encouraging everyone, especially young people, to question without restraint, to think intelligently about the world we live in, and to be able to validate information that's presented to us. And a wonderful last word. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a wonderful discussion. The truth is in the stars. It is available uh, to Canadians um, on demand uh, through the movie network and on HBO. So look for that. That's incredible. Our wonderful panel, Avery Broderick, Natalie Panic, Neil Turok, and Craig Thompson. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.